to to start things off, um, who are we? Well, we're sick, sick organization. You you you, you probably know about us, and uh, we have a um, a wide product portfolio, and we have um, a, a large global presence uh, in the market um, with with a number of uh, different areas uh, to our business. Uh, historically, very famous for. Uh, light guards and photoelectric sensors. You probably familiar with track and trace and, and vision systems and things like that. And um, this this slide just shows you um, sort of the stature of of SIC and um, some of the uh, the facts and figures about our company. So it's always worthwhile to uh, to give you a, a little uh, flavour of uh, the you know what the SIC organisation is. But today, um, we're going to concentrate on a sector of our business, uh, instrumentation. And before we, we go deep into the the, uh, the technologies, um, just give you a quick overview of, of SICK instrumentation. Um, so we're fast becoming a, a well-recognized and established manufacturer uh, of innovative process instrumentation. Um, the product portfolio is continually evolving in many instrumentation disciplines of, of level, pressure, temperature, and, and flow. Not, all, not only um, are SICK providing the most optimum engineering solution for instrumentation applications, we're also connecting the data from those sensors uh, into the Internet of Things, uh, including accessibility to, to, to cloud, platforms, IO4 integration, predictive maintenance, data collection and analytics, and as a result, supporting the customer with improved efficiency and increased productivity. And these are all sort of the buzzwords which we're, uh, we're all too familiar with uh, these days. Um, but for today's purposes uh, of the SICK instrumentation range, we're going to concentrate on level. So. Level technologies. There are a wide variety, point level, continuous level technologies, all of which coexist in the market. And uh, all these technologies have advantages, disadvantages when applied to dynamic process applications. In this webinar, you'll learn about the principle of operation of some of these technologies, the advantages and disadvantages, and where they're most likely to be used as well. And although there are numerous techniques available for the purposes of this webinar, uh, I'll focus on the more popular technologies associated with factory automation applications covering the following techniques. So for point level, we'll look at electromechanical, optical, conductivity, capacitance impedance spectrum, Troscopy, <laughs> vibronics, and for continuous level measurement, we'll look at ultrasonics, capacitance, hydrostatics, guided wave radar, and free space radar as well. It's also worth noting that some of the continuous level measurement um, technologies also have point level detection as well. So, Straight away, we'll jump in. Um, electromechanical, probably the most traditional point level technology uh, for liquids and for solids is electromechanical uh, devices. For liquids, it's more commonly known as float switch technology and works on the electromechanical principle. So the float is installed at a predefined point in the vessel and sits on top of the liquid. When the liquid moves the float, the mechanical motion up or down actuates, uh, actuates the switch. So the liquid comes in contact, moves the float, and we get a detection. Similar, when you're working with solid material as, as well, um, you have um, rotary type uh, mechanical, electromechanical switches. And again, working on the same principles of electromechanical as a motor drive that uh, sorry a motor drives a shaft 
um, at the end of which is a rotor. You can see here is a paddle. The paddle rotates in the vessel until the bulk material stops its rotation, triggering two small micro switches inside. The first signals the limit has been reached and the second switches off the motor, actuating the relay output to the operator. So what are the advantages of this, this technique? Well, it's simple. It's simple point level detection, really cost effective, you know, um, very, uh, very cheap on the market. It's traditional as well. Lots of, um, lots of people know about it and they can be metal or plastic versions and they're easy to install. The disadvantages though, are coating, deposit buildup, moving parts, wear and tear. They have proved unreliable. So within the market, you do tend to hear more from their reputation of being unreliable. And they have low sensitivity. They can be replaced with other switch techniques quite easily as well, quite retrofitable. Where would you use those kind of switches, those electromechanical uh, mechanical switches? Well, standard stuff, really. Overfill protection and empty tank detection, product storage control, on or off pump control as well, especially with the liquid uh, sensors. And when you're using the bulk material sensor, they're being very, very well populated in those areas as well. So we look at optical sensors. Um, they detect the, the level of a fluid at a predefined point as well. This technology is used for liquid only and uses the photoelectric principle of operation. So the sensor comprises of a prism, as you can see here, with two LEDs inside, and one transmitting and the other is receiving. The transmitting LED, which is the, the one on the bottom, emits a light, which is then redirected by the prism towards the receiving LED. Once the fluid comes in contact with the prism, the light is diffracted through the fluid, no longer reaching the receiving LED causing the sensor to switch. Very simple, very basic. Hopefully, as I said earlier about bandwidth, I do hope this works. Just to give you an idea of how the, how the sensor actually works, I have a small video. There's a quick demonstration of the optical sensor switching on water. And if you notice the local LED change from green to yellow um, when the prism makes contact with the water. Uh, prism touches the water, the LED is changed. So the advantages of this technology, no moving parts, unlike the electromechanical technology. It's robust, it's compact, no calibration teaching as well on the fluid. It is extremely cost-effective and would rival the electromechanical technologies. Really simple to install. Although, like everything, it has disadvantages as well coating and residue build up. So if the media is viscous uh, or it's um, you know, quite adhesive, it can coat. Then the, lens, uh, the, the coating on the actual optical lens wouldn't know if the media has moved away. So the sensor would stay energized. It's got limitations to its process um, applications. So for example, 
operating temperatures and pressures uh, are quite limited. Foam as well, it, can, it, can't, it can't differentiate. It's not hygienic, whereas you have other probes in the field which are more, more beneficial for sanitary applications. Abrasive materials as well, abrasive liquids. So things like sand in water that are moving at quite a high velocity through a pipe. This this sensor would, um, would 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 struggle with that. So where would you again kind of see these types of applications? Really for water, water based uh, level detection, overspill, empty pipe, uh, empty tank protection, on off pump, very simple stuff, empty pipe detection as well, and to run dry pump protection. So if for example you have a quite a, a high cost pump. Um, maybe two, three thousand pounds. What you don't want is that pump to run dry because it'll burn out. So placing something like this very simple switch in a pipe and giving a feedback loop into the um, control system could detect when the pump is um, running low on pumping the pumping the liquid through. And if it becomes an empty pipe situation, you could save that pump from from destruction. So we move on to conductivity because these are conductivity switches, not conductivity in the sense of measuring analytically the conductivity value of the fluid, but actually the detection of, of the fluid. And conductive uh, detection sensors rely on the principle of um, electrical conductivity, basically. This kind of detection sensor is triggered when an electrical circuit is established by the presence of a conductive media. So you have a single rod probe and that can only be used in conjunction with metal containers, whereby the conductive liquid completes the electrical circuit between the container wall and functions as the ground and the single rod probe itself. So you make your complete circuit based on that arrangement. What you also have is um, dual rod uh arrangements or configurations of these types of sensors and also multi multi rods as well and again the electrical contact is established using the the longest rod and the additional rods in the liquid the no connection to the wall is is um is necessary because the switch point can then be defined by shortening one of the rods so you make your electrical circuitry based on the number of probes that are used and the longest one is the is the reference. Quite simple. It has some advantages. It's got single or multi-point switches. So you can have one switch or you can have quite a number of switches. You can shorten to a desired length. So when it comes on site, you know, you can cut these things to length. Really simple installation cheapest chips, but they also have some disadvantages as well. You need to use conductive liquids. So that's, that's one of the um, prerequisites of this technique. Coating residue buildup and bridging. So if you have a dual rod or a, a, a multiple rod arrangement and you're dealing with a media that's got suspended solids, for example, or, or, or material that could potentially coat the probe, Bridging can be a problem because it then forms the connection between the two rods. Um, again, the sensor will think that it's still energized. And you need uh, to ground the sensor to the vessel if you're only using a single rod. It's not generally recommended for hygienic or sanitary applications because of potential bridging uh, of bacteria in between the um, the rods. But where would you use these types of switches? You know, again, commonly they follow a similar trend, overfill, protection, empty pipe detection for high, for low. Simple water applications, really. On-off pump control, again, for control, control, um, control functions. Storage and processing containers where you would see quite a number of these types of products. Okay, so we look at capacitive impedance spectroscopy 
And um, this is one of the more recent technologies in the field of um, point level detection. In a similar principle to capacitance sensors, um, an electric uh, field uh, generates around the sensor tip. When this electric field is disturbed due to contact presence of a, a liquid, the capacitance changes, which in turn modifies the resonance, uh, sorry, the resonant impedance uh, in the electrical circuitry of the sensor. And uh, a command is then given and the sensor provides a switch output. So fairly, fairly straightforward. I have another one to show you. Again, you see LED turns from orange to green as soon as it comes in contact with the orange juice. So what are the advantages of this technology? Well, no moving parts again, um, easy to clean. So these, these are really good for hygienic applications where you have clean in place or sterilize in place cycles. They're reliable and repeatable, the, the type of technology that it is. The compact and simple installation. They do have some disadvantages, and that's when it comes to things like extremely low dielectric values of the of the liquids. They can sometimes struggle to get down to really really low uh, DK values of of uh, fluids. So things like thick surface foam as well that can trigger these sensors. Heavy buildup and coating. Although, when you have additional functions on these sensors, you can overcome these types of problems. And one of them is by using IO Link um, and using the functionality of IO Link to make adjustments to overcome buildup and coating around the uh, tip of the probe. Where are the applications? As you, you thought, probably. Uh, Realizing that they, again, they're coming down to the similar types of installation areas and applications where you have uh, empty pipe detection, run dry pump protection. They're involved uh, quite a lot in food and beverage industries, overfill protection and empty pipe detection applications as well. And again, on off, on off pump control. So if we look at the vibronic range um, of sensors, um, we look at tuning forks. And uh, this is a, a very well established um, technology uh, used to detect, you know, limit values of, of fluids uh, or solids, as you can see here. And using um, acoustic technology, their principle of operation evaluates the changes in frequency when a fluid or a solid makes contact with the sensor. So for a liquid tuning fork, uh, the vibration is increasingly fast at resonant frequency. Immersing the fork in the liquid causes uh, a dampening effect, which modifies the frequency and triggers a switching signal. And what influences that is the density of the liquid, and that can influence the, the resonance of the, the tuning fork. Similarly for solids, um, the vibration is pulsed to avoid uh, air pockets in in bulk material applications and contact with the bulk material causes a large dampening effect on the amplitude as a result the switch command is issued so basically these sensors are looking for um their oscillation to be to be uh, impeded and i've got a quick couple of demos this is one with using the the liquid tuning fork so again, you'll see the LED. You can actually possibly hear it change. You hear it uh, resonate, and then once it enters the, the, the liquid or comes in contact with the liquid, that, that um, resonance is dampened, as we just said. Okay, so the second one is using the bulk solid material you the dual tuning for book we've got some bulk sand you can see the led change from green 
to red. What you'll notice with this one is, is a slight delay, and you know that can be altered um, depending on the sensitivity. But generally, with bulk material applications, the fill and the empty of a of a tank is is relatively slow. So that's why there's a um, short short sort of kind of delay on there as well. So again, just quickly running over the advantages. Well, they're really good at repeating that switch. You know, um, there's no moving parts on the on the sensor. They cover quite a multiple of applications, and they're very popular. <laughs> You know, a lot of uh, customers, a lot of people, they know about this technology and um, have trusted this technology for, for a number of years in their processes. Although, like everything, they carry disadvantages, heavy coatings, especially for liquids. You can get what's known as bridging across the, across the forks. Excessive loads as well. So if you've got a bulk material that is um, quite, quite heavy and the sensor's um, at the bottom, of the of a silo for example there's a lot of excessive load on on the sensor uh bridging yeah I just mentioned it you you can get quite a bit of bridging between um liquids but also with solids as well so you can see there's uh, on on the right hand side there the top picture that's a, that's a twin dual tuning fork however as a contingency against that you can use what's known as a monopro version um which uh, acts as a sort of contingency against th those bridging problems and that's where you would generally use uh, the monoprobe on, on um, material that is um, is quite quite large like rocks or granite that kind of thing that you you could see uh, causing a bridge between the tuning fork and the tuning forks um, dual versions would be generally used more for powders in that in that case the applications well loads they're everywhere um anywhere really is liquids uh this bulk solid materials the the usual suspects of, of protection of the product uh over spilling out the the silos or or emptying um uh, detection controlling pumps run dry protection especially for the the vibronic sensors as well and also, um, we find quite recently a lot of uh, applications where you have oil um, on top of water and that type of detection. Now, with a with a, a standard tuning fork, the, the switch it, it's on or it's off. But when you start to look at the um, sort of hidden power of of using the 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 frequency of the sensors, we can now make adjustments in the sensor over IO link to detect the difference between the densities of oil or and, and of water so the sensor then becomes more of um like con uh, condition monitoring and starts to become much more than just a switch okay so we touched on quite a lot of point level detection we move on now to the continuous level measurement technologies and we have ultrasonic sensors uh, used for continuous level, but also they have um, uh, solid state outputs as well uh, for detection. And these can be used for either for liquids or for solids. And the sensor works on um, uh, the basis of uh, time of flight principle. So it has an emission of the sound pulse, as you can see here, uh, reflection of that sound pulse and then the reception of the echo and the time taken to send and receive the sound pulse is, is directly proportional to the measured distance some of the advantages of um, ultrasonics is quite clearly it's non-contact so the sensor doesn't come in contact with any of the uh, material that it's measuring they are very accurate ultrasonic sensors are pretty accurate based on water you could get an accuracy within one maybe two millimeters the fast response as well they have quite a wide range of materials of construction so you can see that on the right hand side they've got solid stainless steel versions they have a um, 
PV, uh, P PTFE sensor with a PV PVDF <laughs> membrane coating. Um, but you can also um, find sensors that have um, completely PVDF material. So if, if the applications are chemically aggressive, for example, um, the, wet, the wetted parts in, on the sensor itself um, can, can be completely plastic. The disadvantage is you can't use them on vacuum applications. So if there is a depressurization inside a vessel, for example, and it draws a vacuum, sound, as we know, can't travel uh, in a vacuum. Surface foaming is a real problem because the ultrasound becomes absorbed. It dampens the signal. Condensation, heavy buildup around the sensor itself, um, that can cause erratic readings. Plumes of dust. So we're talking things like when flour or cement, very fine plumes that are, are creating a quite a dense uh, amount of um, dust. And, it, and dust is very difficult to, to quantify. Strong vapors can also affect the speed of sound. Uh, for example, these sensors are generally calibrated on the density of air, so the speed of sound traveling through the density of air. And if that density changes in, in any way, then that can have an effect on the, on the speed of sound traveling to and, and back to the sensor. Typical applications, liquids and solids, corrosive fluids, really. You know, where you've got applications um, which are um, aggressive to metallic, um, uh, metallic materials. They can protect for overspill and an empty empty tank and control pumps and also give you the volume capacity inside a tank. Okay, so we look at uh, capacitance um, technology now. So many traditional capacitance level probes, um, they require a second plate and in almost all cases ground that probe to, um, uh, to the vessel to complete a, an electrical system. However, a more innovative method, uh, one which um, is uh, exclusive to SICK actually, uh, uses integrated uh, electrodes inside the, the, the probe to, to span uh, and measure the capacitive field. So when the fluid makes contact with the probe, it influences the measured capacitance. That's linear to the level. This change in capacitance is then evaluated and the output is then directly proportional to the measured level and the distance of the, or the length rather, of the, uh, of the probe. In addition, the probe can detect the capacitance changes at predefined levels, so you can set predefined set points, allowing the operator to you know, measure and control level con uh, concurrently as well. So you, you're continuously monitoring, but you're also detecting as well. Um, and this technique, this technology, uh, highly resisted material. So the, the wetted parts are polypropylene. It's repeatable. It also integrates uh, temperature measurement. That's not exclusive to SICK. Uh, lots of uh, passenger probes have that feature now. Good advantage of this sensor is it has a very small inactive zone. So the actual um, maximum level that you want to measure doesn't need to be compensated through a standoff piece when you mount the probe into a tank. Some disadvantages, um, heavy foam, big buildup. It can't distinguish between um, the level or me uh, media that it's measuring and um, any, any buildup or foam that's uh, inside that, that type of application. Um, you're teaching, you have to tell it what it is. So you have to say, yep, yeah, you're on water or no, you're on, uh, you're on oil. Um, that's that's one of the things that um, has been a, a disadvantage for this this kind of technology. Um, probe reduction, you can't cut them. <laughs> you have to order them from any manufacturer, really, um, at a predefined length. And sometimes it can happen where it comes to site and it's not fit, quite fitted in the in the right um, right application. So you can't reduce it. Um, and as I said earlier, quite a, a number of the capacitance probes these days are, are dependent on the vessel material to 
make that grounding to complete that um, that full that full circuitry. Um, but the the sixth sensor adopts that technology, um, which uh, means it's independent of the vessel material, so it doesn't have to be metallic. You know, it can be plastic, it can be um, an open tank concrete, something like that. Where are they used? Again, detection, measurement, uh, water or oil-based liquids. So um, the diversity in the in the fluids uh, that this sensor can measure. Hydraulic applications for oil. It's a big uh, area for capacitance probes. Really small containers because of that small inactive area. Um, the small containers are, are, are a big uh, area for, for this type of technology. Corrosive fluids as well. So again, where metallic wetted parts can't be used, you've got a, a very high resisted material uh, on these probes. Okay, so moving on, uh, hydrostatics. Um, so a pressure sensor, <laughs> it can be adapted from simple pressure monitoring applications to measure continuous level of a liquid inside a vessel. There are two types of uh, hydrostatic sensors. And the first is when you place the sensor at the bottom of a tank. The second referred to as a submersible pressure sensor. Entry point from the top and lowered to a bottom position, as you can see in the picture. The technology is based on the force and uh, a liquid exerts on, on the membrane of a pressure sensor when positioned at the, the bottom of a vessel. If the operator knows the defined density um, of the liquid uh, and then compared uh, to water, the measured pressure value for other liquids can be converted to a fill level using, using this formula here. In a closed tank, the principle of operation is is the same. Uh, pressure sensor, you know, to measure the hydrostatic li liquid level. So you could use again one at the bottom and, and one submerged uh, from the top down to the bottom. However, the the total hydrostatic pressure is a combination of the enclosed gas pressure as well and the hydrostatic liquid head pressure. So we're looking at the gas plus the liquid gives us the P total there, as you can see. Therefore, an additional pressure sensor is, um, is obviously required. Um, all these values are, are then entered into a uh, slightly modified formula and you can derive the calculation of the true level of the liquid with, uh, without the, uh, the gas pressure. So this is where pressure sensors are used for hydrostatics in, in open tanks, um, but also in uh, closed pressurized tanks as well on, on different media. The advantages, um, they're really accurate and repeatable. Um, they have a very wide, I was going to say deep measurement depths up to 250 meters deep. So where you have uh, borehole type applications. Uh, numerous installation points at the bottom. You can lower these things in from the top. You can use them on the outlet of a pipe um, when when it's uh, being used with a, uh, a shut-off valve. Lots of variants in the process connections. They can be used for quite standard applications or, or sanitary hygienic applications. So the disadvantages, though, um, if you have varying liquid densities, um, that has an impact on on um, on the pressure. Material buildup as well. You know, if you've got a sensor at the bottom of a tank, which uh, maybe doesn't have a flush diaphragm, for example, it's uh, a small orifice, then you can get a lot of buildup if there's sediments in the in the media. Um, if you have the submersible, you have to make sure that the uh, air vent that's used right up the cable that comes out to atmospheric um, doesn't get blocked. <laughs> because you're looking for that, um, that balance with the atmospheric pressure. And if there's varying temperatures, because temperature variation has a direct impact on, on um, both the density and, and uh, the, the force of pressure. But some 
um, hydrostatic sensors nowadays have a lot of temperature compensation in there as well. So the, there's there's ways around um, compensate for those types of uh, issues on site. Where would you use them? Uh, again, continuous level measurement, small, large, well, really large vessels, boreholes and shaft applications, milk story silos in the, you know, the, the dairy industry there are um, probably one of the most common uh, technologies to use for monitoring uh, milk um, in, in silos and processing tanks and storage and, and places like that. Uh, reservoirs and canals and lakes, uh, especially with the submersible type uh, arrangement. So, just a couple more to go. Guided wave radar technology, uh, also referred to as uh, time domain reflectometry, um, which is a, is a pulsing radar, um, basically based on a, an operating principle of time of flight. So the sensor generates uh, a low electro, uh, sorry, a low energy electromagnetic uh, reference pulse. Um, this radar pulse then uh, creates uh, an exit pulse, which in turn ex uh, exits the sensor. It's carried down the rod, strikes the surface of the liquid. A proportion of the pulse energy is then reflected back up along the probe to the sensor's electronics. The time difference to send and receive the radar pulse is directly proportional to the length of the rod. Okay. Some of the advantages unaffected by any of the fluid property changes. So for example, if the uh, conductivity, viscosity, density changes, it doesn't affect the functionality of this technology. Really good against buildup, no moving parts. So, um, no chance of any wear and tear. Probe lengths can be reduced with this technology. So you can cut down the probes and you can then reteach the length. Some disadvantages, um, anything below 1.8 on a DK value of a fluid. Um, for those of you familiar obviously with the DK values, give you an example, water is has a DK value of, or DC value, how you interpret it, um, of 80. Whereas something like palm oil, has a um, DK value of around 1.82. So this is the um, electrical properties of, of, the, of the media. It is a contact technology. So you have things like agitation inside a tank um, that, can, that can cause uh, an issue because obviously the probe needs to be directly in contact with the fluid. Plastic tanks or oil. Um, unless you use a coax tube arrangement. And this is one example you can see here in the picture is where you have a coax tube, which is a metal tube, which uh, fits directly around um, the sensor. And what that does is it acts then effectively as the tank. So if it was a plastic tank on the outside, this sensor now has its own metallic tank where the um, pulse um, amplitude is, is actually intensified as well. So it's really good on those low dielectric applications um, where we say down to about 5 dK without a coax tube and anything lower than that, we would recommend um, a coax. Foam. Um, but one of the advantages um, of the SICK probe is that we have an algorithm inside the sensor that actually um, is able to um, de detect and measure directly through foam. So for us, it's not it's not an issue. Where are they used? Um, again, following a similar trend as all the other technologies in the market, um, measurement and control, on-off control, process and storage tanks. So if you're moving liquids, if you're storing liquids, you can use them for non-hygienic and hygienic applications. Um, the example there is the, is the picture at the far right. You have the blue one, which is for standard, and then you have um, a hygienic version uh, of the guided way radar. The last uh, and finally technology um, is free space radar. And the principle of operation is based on uh, frequency modulated continuous wave. And 
this is um, this, when the sensor emits a, a continuous frequency modulated radar signal through its antenna. And the emitted signal is reflected by the media and received by the antenna as an echo with modified frequency. And this frequency change is proportional to the distance and converted into a filling level. But since such short times in, in these, these uh, changes are difficult to measure accurately, the advantage of the, the FMCW, which is the Frequency Modulated Continuous Wave uh, <laughs> acronym, um, is it mixes the signals. And uh, as a result, the difference in frequency uh, of both signals is directly, sorry, directly corresponds then to the time difference, um, which indicates the distance. So when the distance between the sensor and the target is increased, also the time shift increases and therefore the frequency, sh frequency shift is increased, enabling a much more accurate and uninfluenced radar measurement. And normally uh, the frequency has, has a, a big impact on that, um, where you would have traditionally things like 26 gigahertz radar sensors. Um, this technology adapts more to the higher frequency of 80 gigahertz uh, frequency technology. So the advantages, um, independent of fluid property changes, you know, this this technology is is very high end. It um, it, it can overcome a number of different problems, um, all the different types of, of process uh, conditions. It's non-contact as well, so it doesn't need to be in contact with the material, whether it's liquid or a solid. You can work it in a vacuum. Doesn't matter about foam, dust, condensate. All these other limitations, which affected quite a number of the other technologies we mentioned earlier. Well, there are maybe some disadvantages, especially the blocking distances on solids as well. So, if you want a real um, not to one hundred percent fill level of the of the vessel, you have to compensate for blocking distances on the solids on the um, on the uh, liquid versions. Um, it's 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 really small. It's really small, especially for the distances that you can measure up to, which is, you know, over 25 meters with these things. Really small tanks, you know, um, that's probably a, a slight restriction. Um, I put this in because it's heart protocol. And whilst it's a um, very historical protocol for process automation industries and companies, um, there's obviously a digital shift now. Um, as we're all experiencing. So um, I was going to put a question mark against that because um, it's still used and it's still heavily used in, in a lot of industries. But there are other uh, protocols and ways to configure commission uh, sensors as well these days. Um, traditionally, free space radar was influenced by in internal objects as well. Uh, as you can see in the picture there, rotary paddles, spray balls, things like that. But with this um fmcw uh you know the frequency modulation um where it has a continuous wave formation um 80 gigahertz the high frequency now is very very concentrated very very focused it's almost like a laser so it has a real big advantage uh in, in the market uh yeah again where level applications are going to be generally, aren't they? You know, liquids and solids. Long distance measurement, you know, it's a very, very wide um, measuring range. Storage and buffer tanks, those kind of things. Um, and bulk feeds. You know, I've touched on probably 10% of applications. You know, this is intended to be a very, very basic overview of all these technologies as well.